uh, and which was uh, Nico uh, Giansopoulos, who was right. absolutely, absolutely mental. So uh, I'm hoping <laughs> I'm hoping you're a little bit more reserved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully your expectations aren't too high after Nico. I'm Definitely. sure he would have been interesting. <laughs> So uh, we usually just start off with some lighter questions just to kind of get the the, the show on the floor uh, on the on the, on a roll. So um, who was like your goalkeeping role model when you were growing up? Who was like the player that you were like, I want to be a goalkeeper because of that guy? Um, honestly, I think the first guy that comes to mind is Edwin Vandersar, um, which is kind of ironic because I'm like six foot zero and Vandersar is just a giant, right? Um, but when I was growing up, then it seemed like the Canadian sports channels always broadcasted the Man U games. Um, and Man U at the time was, was really the powerhouse team. So I always saw Van der Sar playing and just thought he was just an unreal goalkeeper. So um, he was probably the one that kind of made me say like, yeah, this is pretty cool being a goalkeeper and I want to do it. Um, but then as I got a little bit older and started to know a few more goalkeepers and um, Asmir Begovic probably became a, a little bit more of my role model and that was primarily because he lived in Edmonton for a while and um, played for the same youth club that I did so there was that little bit of a connection there for me. That's really cool so have you tried to like hit him up on Instagram trying to get you in at Everton or <laughs> uh, that wouldn't be bad no uh, no but I haven't hit him up yet uh, you know maybe I should drop him a line and see I think, if he'll, I think you should just dedicate a game to him or something. Uh, so, yeah, uh, there you go. What's the, what's the first, I, I asked most of the outfield players, what's their first pair of football boots? But I thought I'd ask you, what, what's the first pair of goalie gloves you remember actually uh, having? Uh, you know what? I remember there was a pair of Adidas goalkeeper gloves that uh, I wore. And I, I, there's no way I could remember the the model name. I don't even know the model name of the Yule Sport goalkeeper gloves I wear these days. <laughs> but uh, oh, uh, I remember this this pair of Adidas goalkeeper gloves, and they are just absolutely beat. I, I think I wore them for two seasons straight or something. But I love them. They uh, they matched my shoes, and and yeah, I just wore them all the time. Practices, games, which obviously these days you. I don't do, you know, separate pair of gloves for practice and game. Um, but these gloves were just always on me and just got absolutely beat. I love I love that, man. It's like, just so to match your shoes, that's the, the perfect answer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's your uh, what's your favorite sports movie or book? <clears throat> hmm. um, that's a tough one. I, I don't know, sports movie, I... I the one that I think of right now is The Longest Yard with Adam Sandler. <laughs> Holy uh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know why, I don't know why that was the first one that came to my mind. All right, we're going to go with that one then. The worst <laughs> the worst sports movie of all time. We're going to take that one. All right. <laughs> that's, I, don't, I don't know if I can say that that's my favorite ever, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm struggling to think of ones when it, when it comes to sports movies. Um I guess, you know, one that I actually did like back in the day was bench warmers, um, okay. the baseball one that, yeah. that one was pretty entertaining, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. What about you? You oh, seem uh, like you must have a, a good one or two. Yeah. Like I, I really enjoyed, like I'm obviously older than you, but like there was a movie, there was a movie when I was growing up that was always on around Christmas time called, uh, escape to victory. So I had like Bobby Moore, uh, Ozzy Ardiles, Pele, uh, had a, had a, this an amazing cast in it, and it basically was about these uh, POWs in World War Two who play at a football game. And they tried to escape from the Germans, and it was it's a really okay. good movie. And then oh, obviously, cool. obviously like Rocky Four, you can't beat Rocky Four, right? Just for that, <laughs> just for that True. thing. Yeah, just so you know, he, he he's like the the uh, the underdog. It's uh, everybody does an underdog story. Yeah. But it's really funny though because every time I ask, and people always kind of have like opinions about sports people that they're not always the smartest up top which is, is totally not true because all everybody in the Canadian Premier League has gone to university and stuff for that but not I don't think one person has actually answered that that question and gave me a book uh, yeah yeah you know what <laughs> I was thinking ooh, sports books that I've read probably about zero <laughs> Well, like, you know, <clears throat> the the intellectual powerhouse that is the longest yard definitely makes up for it. So <laughs> gonna... 
<laughs> no doubt. No doubt. So the, for, the, first, the first question I have for you, man, is like, how's the feeling being back in front of your own fans and beating the league leaders at home? That must have been pretty oh. sweet. Yeah, it was uh, it was unbelievable. Honestly, it was just so amazing to be back in front of fans um, and, and especially to be at home. Um, you know, just yesterday we played down at Spruce Meadows in Calgary and um, the, the fans down there, they get after you quite a bit. But I had a couple of people asking me after the game, oh, do the fans bother you? You know, they're getting after you all game. And I said, no, honestly, it's just great to have fans in the stands. It doesn't matter if they're for me, against me, it's just so special to have fans in the stands again after so long without them. Um, but of course, nothing compares to the fans at, at Clark Stadium for me. Um, it, it's really special being able to play in front of them and especially to look up in the stands because I'm, at, I'm, I'm from Edmonton. So yeah. um, being able to look up in the stands and, you know, see all my family and my girlfriend and everything, it's, it's a really special moment for me. Um, and then to be beating Valor on that occasion um that was just the cherry on top yeah but like i i could just i I just i'm just glad that they were there because it'd be kind of horrible for you to look up to the stand to look for them and none of your family (laughs) we're gonna go to dinner instead there's something that was supposed to do tonight but i can't remember (laughs) yeah yeah no i'm lucky with them they're they're pretty courteous that way (laughs) so so that's the thing like i i was going to ask you about like i mean like you went from it's like two polar opposites like you go to Clark Stadium, all the uproar, everybody loving you. You're the hometown hero, da 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 da. And then straight away, down to Calgary, and everybody's like giving you the gear. So, like, what was the atmosphere like in the stadium? Though, was it like was it just pure brutalness, or was it like kind of a fun kind of uh, kind of fun rivalry? What, what was the atmosphere like for you? Uh, the atmosphere yesterday down at, at Spruce Meadows. You mean? Yeah, I would say. I, I wouldn't necessarily say sheer brutalness, but it definitely was hostile. Like the, the, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it was a uh, friendly, you know, here's some banter back and forth sort of thing. It was definitely hostile. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I find it really fun to be in that sort of environment and um, knowing that the fans are getting into it and everything and knowing that it means something to them is, is also kind of special. Um, because there's nothing worse than being in a stadium and and knowing that the people there don't really care about what's going on Um, so even though it it was pretty hostile towards myself and my teammates it's no problem it was it was great atmosphere yeah I was actually at the the Wanderers grounds for Halifax's game on on Monday and uh, poor Dylan Powley was like playing right in front of the kitchen which is like the kind of yeah the the terrace part of, of the Wanderers ground and yeah, he was getting he was getting some I wouldn't say like horrendous abuse, but he was getting like pretty personal abuse, I would say. And <laughs> like I, I messaged him afterwards and I was like, man, like I felt really bad being in the middle of it. Like obviously I'm not gonna be like to like two thousand people. Now guys, come on, you're going a bit too far yeah. now. So I like I I, I always kind of wondered like how you guys like rise above it like do you, do you just are you able to just like block it out and just forget it and just move on like i, I to me I, i'd be crying at the end of the game i'm so sensitive so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you know it kind of down you're talking about at wanderers ground how there's that little bit of a terrace behind the one uh goal it, it's very similar at spruce meadows they have that similar sort of grandstand right behind the goal so i think the abuse that dylan was receiving on monday was probably somewhat similar to what i was receiving just last night but uh <laughs> Yeah, I, to answer your question, I, I'm, a, I try to be at least a very vocal goalkeeper. So I find that when I'm the more the more I'm vocalizing or yelling at my players, then the more I can't hear what's going on around me. Um, so I often end up just drowning it out by yelling myself, and then I can't <laughs> even hear it. So it's kind of a, a, you know, killing two birds with one stone sort of situation. That's an amazing answer. I love it. Like I just drown her out by just shouting louder than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, instead of shouting back at the fan, <laughs> just shouting at my players instead, and then I can't hear it. <laughs> so uh, last year at the Island Games, uh, 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 you guys didn't have the best of times, unfortunately. But uh, Alan's come in, and things definitely seem to be going in the right direction. Um, so what changes has he made since he's come in? Like I'm not nothing against Jeff. Jeff had his own way of doing things. Like, um, but what's kind of changed since Alan's come in? Yeah. Um, well, first thing we had. A decent amount of personnel changeover. Um, I think that some of the additions that Alan's made have been very good and I like where our squad is at right now. Um, and, and then 
on the kind of more management side, I would say Alan just has a lot of experience, right? He, he's been a professional coach for a very long time and um, he's coached at a lot of different levels and, you know, has experience in the MLS where there's so much more offered to you as a, a manager or a gaffer where, you know, you, you just get so many resources and then being able to try out all those different resources, you acquire new understanding, new new processes, new things that you know you should be doing, um, whether it's leading into a game, after a game, whatever. Um, so I think that lots of that experience that Alan had at those other professional environments has been brought into our environment at FC Edmonton. Um, and so I just, I, I feel like there's good things happening and, and you know, everybody's working towards um, doing the right thing all the time and and the professionalism I think that Alan's brought in has been top notch so um, yeah he's he's been good good for the team for sure so I, I always kind of wonder like what type of managers people are like you know like you've got those kind of standoff aloofish ones and you've got ones like who like <clears throat> I was kind of watching a little bit of uh, Ottawa's training on on Sunday and I saw him Easter he was like going into the stands like to get the footballs and all that kind of stuff it's just kind of like you know you don't expect a coach to be doing <laughs> yeah. that kind of thing so yeah. like, like it, what type of manager is, is alan is he like a kind of like a you know i hate using the phrase but a tracksuit manager like he's on the pitch and he's kind of in like or is he like kind of that he likes to stand back and see what's happening and then kind of comes up towards the end and gives you guys uh, advice i would say he's definitely like out of the two kind of profiles that you just described there i'd say he's definitely a lot more the first um so he's a lot more involved he's you know right in there in training yelling at the players and trying to get his point across um he's a he's a personable guy he comes off with a bit of a thick exterior um but really he's just as interested in um, being friendly with the guys as as anybody is but I think that what's really good about Alan is he he keeps that line where yes he's he's your your friend on a personal level but he's your boss on a professional level. Um, so I think that he does a really good job of kind of toying that line of being friends with his players um, and and really being there for them, but at the same time um, keeping them accountable to him as their boss. Yeah, that's 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 a great way of putting it. That's uh, that's awesome. So, yeah. <clears throat> so I, I had to, uh, Tommy Wilden Jr. on on, on the, the the show there last week, and he's he's a really passionate guy about football. Like when you talk to him, and, and but he's like he, he's he loves the kind of the the tactic side of it. Like you know, he, everything's a chess game to him because he was talking about the Forge game that they played where he had like. I don't know, 20 formation changes in a game and stuff like that. So, so is, is that, is that, is that, is that like, I don't know if that's a Calvary thing or is that like just a football, professional football thing in general? Like, are you guys like constantly changing formations? Like, like, is that the way the game's gone? Where it, like you start three, five, two, and then suddenly like you're four, four, two within 10 minutes. Is, is that the way the game has gone? Yeah, I think that that's a little bit more the way that the game has gone, at least from my experience. Um, I think we've been fortunate enough where we have decided that we're going to kind of stick more, more so with one formation. Um, I guess we, we've had a couple of changes, but it, I think that for the most part, when we're in a game, um, we'll, we'll try to stick to one formation. Um, but of course, it, if we need to change based off of how the other team is playing, then we make the change. Um, but generally I, I think that, our approach is we want to, we, we have certain aspects that we think we should be good at or that we're always training to be good at. Um, and we want to be able to kind of impose those characteristics onto another team. We don't necessarily want to be reactionary to looking at how another team is playing and say, okay, we got to completely change everything we're doing in order to accommodate to what they're doing. Um, but with that being said, I definitely do agree with you where um, you're saying that, you know, football may have changed to much more of a chess match um, because, you know, the, the pregame scouting, um, the halftime talk, um, postgame analytics, all that stuff is, is really coming down to, you know, the tactical side and, and the changes that need to be made all throughout, whether it's during the game or um, something that's addressed after 
the game and heading into the next game you're you're looking at doing yeah it's definitely it's definitely changed i mean like with like opt and all that kind of stuff like if, like i get the the re- like you see the reports at the end of the game and at half time and like how they're able to like follow everybody's stats to my new detail it, <clears throat> there's nowhere to hide you know if you're yeah. having a, if you're having a stinker of a game or you're not getting involved like the, the numbers are right there in front of you so it's yeah. it's it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of fun to see it. and then sometimes you're just like geez is that all you've done <laughs> you know what i mean it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's just it's just a really different aspect to it so just yeah. speaking of like the game changing for people like for goalkeepers obviously it's changing too where you know yeah. 15 years ago 10 years ago a goalkeeper wasn't always like somebody who was this this who would start off a play like you know they were just there just to save the ball pretty much but now like you have to be so much better with your feet because you're like you've got the sweeper keeper or you know you need to be able to uh play football pretty much right so yeah. <clears throat> for the goalkeepers like what what does what does your day entail like to like your train session because i think everybody has an idea of you know you see like people doing like the, the the, the regular the outfield players just kicking the ball about and stuff like that. But what do you guys actually do like for training like uh, on the course for day? Yeah, typical typical training session for me basically is what you're asking. Yeah. Okay, so um, once we get out onto the pitch, then usually the goalkeepers go will go off with Lars right away. We'll do a little warm up, uh, physical warm up activation on our own, um, and then usually we'll hop into a sort of handling exercise. So. Handling will we'll usually just do some volleys and some um, variations with footwork and that sort of thing to try to get the feet warmed up while also getting the hands warmed up um, and a little bit of the coordination between the two. So that'll probably be like 10, 10 minutes sort of thing, um, 15 minutes maybe. Then it, it really depends, mid-season anyways, it, it depends on what we want to target. If um, let's say in in the last game, I was getting a whole bunch of balls bombed into the box and um, I wasn't happy with how I was dealing with them. Um, Wasn't coming out for enough or I was coming out, but I was dropping them, whatever it may be. Um, Then I'll have the conversation with Lars before practice and say, hey, let's work on crossing today. And then he'll set up a couple of drills where we'll focus primarily on crossing. Um, So it, it really... I would say mid season depends on what you're seeing in the game. If you know, you want to work on a little bit of crossing, then you integrate that into your session. If you want to work on some reaction stuff, you integrate that. And in. if you want to work on your long distribution or maybe picking out a fullback, then you integrate some distribution into the session. But generally I would say it always starts off with the physical activation and then a handling warm up. Um, and then you'll get into whatever the meat and potatoes of your session is. And it, that's really going to, comprise of um, distribution handling um, reaction shot stopping or crosses and you, you have a uh, as you mentioned like Lars there like I mean like he's uh, another Edmonton legend and he almost played for my beloved Tottenham uh, he uh, <laughs> he was on the cusp of it you know but um but like what's it like having something like that around the club I mean like that's like him teaching you like what he knows and, and all that kind of stuff like what, what are you learning from him yeah, it's, it's crazy. I think that um, when I first started with him, my learning curve was just super steep. I think that he taught me so much in the first three months of working with him that it was unbelievable. Um, and, and I would say that maybe the curve has uh, shallowed off a little bit, but I'm still learning all the time from him because he's just got such a, a wealth of knowledge, right? Um, I mean, playing at that level, there's not, not that many... Canadian guys who have played at that level and for that length of time because he played until he was like 38 or something um so he's got a ton of experience under his belt and um I I really think that you know the more experiences you get the more knowledge you have and the more you know how to deal with certain situations um I find it whenever I'm in a, a game and we'll be debriefing what happened then you know he can draw on the experiences because he's had that same thing happen to him multiple times. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm extremely happy to have Lars around. And um, I, I just think that he's such an invaluable resource for me and, and really for the whole team. Cause um, although he's a goalkeeper and, you know, goalkeeper experiences may not be the same as what a, an outfield player experiences um, just the environments that he's been in 
um, and, and the professionalism that's being required in those environments, um, it really goes a long way to kind of pushing our team in the right direction. So, so when you say like the, the learning curve was really steep and now it's kind of leveled off a little bit, are you trying to say you're better than them? <laughs> no, no, no. That's it. I don't. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just send that clip to him. So you, like, yeah. you're going to be doing laps for days, son. <laughs> no kidding. No, no. Maybe I'll retract on that a little bit. I, I was let Let's put it this way. I was so raw when I first started working with him that the learning curve was very steep at the start. But now I've acquired some of the same wealth that he has, or some of the same knowledge, uh, wealth and knowledge that he has. So now he can, you know. He, he, he's already told me things so many times. So, I can't. <laughs> so he's he, he's not as good as you and he's repetitive. Jesus Christ, man, yeah. you're killing yourself yeah. here. Uh, yeah, so, digging a hole. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Quickly moving on. Um, so um, as you mentioned, like the, the recruitment in the off season has been like phenomenal. I think your, yourselves and uh, Valor have like done an amazing job of bringing in players to try and change the team around. Like you brought in... Uh, experienced pros like uh, like Shaman Shom and uh, Fraser Aird. So, what have they brought to the squad themselves? Like, like you know, they, they've played on like some of the biggest stages. So, what they been, yeah. what they brought into the to the squad as well? Yeah, I think um, kind of almost going back to what Lars, what what our discussion about Lars was was talking about. Um, they just have those experiences, right? They've played in these high stress environments, and they've played in environments where the highest level of professionalism is required so they bring that experience to our team and really I think that that was something that we needed we needed that um, player driven professionalism um, and and so I think that they've really been able to push the team in, in a, a positive direction um, but yeah it's 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 been great uh, having a couple of these guys come in and being able to hear some of the stories that they have from some of the places that they've played and everything it, it's it's really awesome yeah I, I mean in particular like uh like fraser like came back to the league last year with valor and he, he just looks like a a different player i mean like like he's scoring like some amazing goals like he's bagging assists so could you yeah. see that yourself from preseason that he was going to take off like that because like last year i don't know what it was whether it was just the, the environment or the team he just didn't see him himself whereas this year he just looks like he's back on form yeah, I think I'm, I'm not positive, but I think last year he was struggling with a bit of an injury through the whole Island games. Um, so that may have been hold, holding them back a little bit, but this year he's been flying for us and um, scored a couple of important goals for us. Just got an assist last night for us. Um, he's assisted many. So I, I'm, I can't say that I'm super surprised. Um, I think that when he came into preseason, I was expecting a lot of him. Um, and I, I think that he probably benefited from having a decently long off season, just, or sorry, a decently long preseason, just the same that any of us have because the off season was so long. Um, so I think that the, the kind of difficult preseason that we had did a good job of preparing myself and, and the rest of them, but just as much Frazier, right? And I think that it's really paying dividends for him right now. So you probably had the best view of that bullet goal he scored into the top corner. Uh, what was it like from your angle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? That was, uh, it was a funny one, kind of my thought process during, during the action because, you know, he's done that so many times in training where he'll just line one up from like 35 yards out. And, you know, sometimes it's off in row and, and when <laughs> I saw him lining it up, I was just thinking, man, this guy isn't going to seriously try it, is he? And then he <laughs> struck it, and I remember thinking, like, oh, this is looking good. <laughs> 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 and then I saw it fly in the top corner, and I couldn't believe it, man. It was oh, incredible. It, it was it was phenomenal. And, like, like watching on TV, I was just like, you know, it's, it's not often when you're watching a game when a goal goes in where you're just, like, kind of speeches for that kind of – 10 20 seconds just to try and work it out in your head what the hell is this guy just done and it was you know as i said after his kind of not so great 2020 it's great to see him back and like that's we need players like that that like somebody who's played for rangers and all that stuff in scotland coming back to the league and, and like pushing pushing it forward because that's what it needs right so yeah um 
So we have to talk about uh, Easton as well. Like he, he, he scored uh, last night, hit the post, uh, but he did have that little bit of a lean spell uh, before he got going again. Um, so like, what was the message to him from the team? Like to like during that lean spell, like, was it like, you know, like chill out, like don't you're, you're snatching that stuff or like, was it just like leave it, leave him to it and just let him work it out himself. Yeah, I think it was mainly just leave him to it. You know, we knew that he was eventually going to be potting them really when with the chances that we are getting to him, we knew that it was just a matter of time. Um, And I think that it can always be tough at the start of the season um, because you're, especially for a striker, your goal tally for the year starts at zero. So it doesn't matter what happened in in prior seasons. Um, And if you don't get off to a quick start, then it can quickly be a shot to your confidence. Um, so I think that really for, for all of us, it was just um, a matter of time. We knew that once he got one, then he'd be good to go. Um, so it was, it was pretty valuable when he got that one against uh, the Wanderers back in the bubble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to bring it up. <laughs> um, and that, that got him on a bit of a roll. And now, now that we're out of the bubble, he's potting them. So we're, I'm, I'm happy with it. So he had the... Um... He had the trip to Denmark. He he went out on loan and stuff like that. So, like, what, what was he saying about the the move? Like, do, do you think it's something that because obviously we're gonna have a, a long off season again because it's Canada and that's just the way it happens. Like, is it something that you would be looking to do yourself just to keep yourself ma- ma fit, ma- match fit, or are you happy enough just to stay where you are and just you know take it easy until we kick off again? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right with Easton. I think that he was uh, primarily interested in getting over there because he knew it was going to be a long off season, and um, he wanted to try to get as many games in because we only got the I think it was seven last year at the Island Games, um, so we wanted to get as many games in for the year as he he could. Um, but it this year, I mean, we're we're I think going to be in season until the second week of November, first week of November somewhere around there and then I think that Alan's plan is to have us kicking off preseason again already February 1st so oh wow it's uh yeah it'll it'll be a pretty quick turnaround for us again this year um so it it may not lend itself to those those loan opportunities um but we'll see you never know yeah man that's uh that like and I think that's what you need though but it's like also you need to have games like I I feel I feel like like for you guys, like I mean, like you're back in preseason and you're having inter squads and all that kind of stuff, but it gets it gets tedious, right? Like you need Not to have, same. yeah, you need to kind of have. So I'm hoping that with COVID gone, that you guys can even do like little mini tours. Because I remember the first season, I think you all went down to was it Dominican or something? Dominican, yeah. Yeah, and, and how was that like when like for for a preseason? It was good. You know, it was it was good. Um, the one thing that I didn't like a lot was the fact that our preseason games were all against teams that were uh, the, the teams that we were going to be playing against in the season. Yeah. Um, that's you know, all, yeah. Like this year, I think we'll probably be playing cavalry like six, six ish times. So, you know, to have a preseason game or two against cavalry and then play them in the season six, six ish times, then it just becomes a little bit monotonous. I'd really like to be able to play against um, some USL teams or, or, you know, maybe even, top level NCAA teams, that sort of thing in, in preseason. Um, but I'm not sure if the timing really works out um, given when our preseason starts and, and when their regular seasons start. Um, Cause I don't think that they'd be overly interested in having games during their season to facilitate our preseason. Um, but you know what, the Dominican, it, it was good. It, it was a lot better than uh, the preseason that we had this year because obviously <laughs> we didn't get any preseason games. So, you know what, games are games and and I'd like whatever we can get. So so that that, that was actually like one of my questions. So in the in the kickoff, the, the, the bubble thing, the the Western teams like seem to be have an edge over the Eastern teams. So are you expecting like for the rest of the season to be like incredibly difficult because you're playing against the teams that were on paper or like like we're doing much better than the other teams like do you think it's going to be a little bit unfair on you or do you think it's better because you're going to play like better teams or yeah you know what i've definitely given some thought to it and i you know you 
you look at the standings coming out of the kickoff and after eight games, I think the top three teams were Valor, Pacific and Cavalry. Um, so it was definitely something that I was looking at saying, this is going to be a bit of a mountain to climb. Um, but you know what, you'd, you'd much rather be playing in competitive games or, or games where you know they mean something than playing games that you, you know, go into them expecting to win. Not to say that any game in this league is, is that way, um, but I, I think it's going to be a tough challenge for us, but I'm excited for it. I, I think it'll be fun to play against these teams um, and, and to... I mean, maybe Valor benefited a little bit from this in, in the kickoff. When you're in that sort of a, a situation or a scenario, then um, I find things can be very streaky. You know, I think we were a good good example of it last year. We kind of got off to a bad start and we just couldn't get out of the rut. Um, so, you know, we hit, we hit a, a streak of bad luck and just continued on that streak. And it, not to say that it was luck that put us in last place last year, um, but you know what I'm trying to get yep, at. Yep. Things can be a little bit streaky. So um, whether teams come out of the bubble in whatever, a good position or a bad position because they're a top quality or bottom quality team or because they hit a little bit of a streak of good luck, bad luck, um, you know, that, that will be told, I guess, as the tale of the rest of the season unfolds. Yeah, you can you can kind of see like already like the the effect um, the home games are having. Like I mean, like Pacific, like Pacific against Calvary, like Calvary just looked like lost when they came out because it was such a, a crazy reception. And the same for Valor in a way because like even though they were playing yeah. home games, like there's only two or three thousand people in a what a thirty five thousand seater stadium, yeah. whereas they come to your place and it's like hectic. Like a lot of players haven't played in that sort of environment and the ones that have it's been so long they probably forget so I, I think you're right and I think Valor might struggle a little bit just for that like it was great for them to be in the bubble but I think coming out of the bubble and like it might be a little bit of a different story for them so um <clears throat> but one of my uh I, I do hate to talk about the bubbles and like it's like we're all kind of pissed off at this stage and I'm glad hopefully we never have to talk to it, about them ever again but I, I never really got a chance to ask a goal what was well, like for the goalkeepers because you know the players like were, were saying that the games were so close and like the, the injuries were racking up but obviously the game affects your bodies in different ways so what was it like for the goalkeepers having that many uh games so close together yeah um you know after a game i i wouldn't necessarily say that i'm physically drained um, I would say that I'm a little bit fatigued physically, but not, not too, too bad. Um, but a lot of it comes from the mental exhaustion. Um, you know, it's, it can be a, a tough task to yell at people for 90 minutes straight. <laughs> and, um, that just the stress of being a goalkeeper, knowing that if you make a mistake, then it's probably going to end up in the back of your net versus a striker. If he makes a mistake, you know, he, it's a goal kick instead of a goal and you know that stress doesn't weigh on you the same way it does as a goalkeeper um so i find after games i'm, I'm usually pretty mentally fatigued um but usually that that can kind of go away in in an evening or with the day's rest um so i, I think from my perspective i didn't struggle too too much um with the game load um it's just kind of getting through you know you pick up a little knock in in training where maybe you take a shot funny off the foot or a shot funny off the finger or something like that. And then you have to manage because all of a sudden you have a game again in one day and then another game in three days after that. So um, it can just be managing kind of the extent of training you want to do or the extent of training that you should be doing. Um, kind of being cognizant of the recovery um, at the same time, injury prevent prevention, and then also making sure that you're sharp enough for, for the game when it comes. So it, yeah, it can be a little bit difficult to kind of navigate, but overall I felt, I felt okay throughout the bubble and, and I probably wasn't complaining as much as the outfield players needed to be because that's, <laughs> I don't, it's, it's tough. I, I can't imagine running, especially in the heat that they had in, in Winnipeg, it was, mid thirties, lots of days and on the turf, even hotter. And, um, yeah, I, 
I applaud all the players for going out there and running for 90 minutes and in that sort of heat and then turning around and doing it three days later again. Yeah, I mean, like people like Andre Rampersa, who played like every minute, yeah. probably, probably deserves a medal at the end of the season. So, so what was it like, like, like during, during, during like the the, the heat? Like, there was everything going on. There was like the heat wave, the thunderstorms, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then there was a, a smoke warning and stuff like that. So, like, what was that like? Was it like when you were training? Was it affecting you? Like, or were you allowed to train? Like, what was going on? Like during that whole thing? Yeah, I think. Uh... I think there was only one day where we had training canceled. I think it might've actually been the day before the Wanderers game. Um, the, the second Wanderers game that is. Um, but yeah, the, the smoke was, was something that affected a little bit because you didn't necessarily know if your games are going to be going or not. Because I think if, if the whatever air quality index is above a six, then you're not allowed to play. Um, and I think that on the day of, one of our games, it must have been that uh, Wanderers game. I remember it was hovering around a five, a six for most of the day. So then it was kind of, you know, you're in a bit of a quandary. Are, are we playing this afternoon? Are we not playing? Um, so that was a little bit difficult as well um, because, you know, especially when you have game after game after game after game, the thought of, oh, maybe we aren't going to have to play today. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it could get to you a little bit. So that was, I'm sure that that was a little bit difficult because uh, you have to stay fully switched on, but no, it, it was all right. Not too bad. That, that's funny. And so, you know, you, you've been, you've been with Edmonton pretty much since the start uh, of their uh, trip into the, the CPL. So how, how has it changed the, the, the league itself? Cause like now we're, we're starting to get back a little bit to normality and, we've gone past all the the, the the nutty stuff but like how's the league like grown like in in terms of professionalism of like how it's run all that kind of stuff like how how is it how is it adapting as it goes along is it getting better is it the same yeah um you know what i honestly i i think the biggest difference for me is the the quality the the quality of the players has seemed to increase over the years um i think that this year especially you know you look up, up and down teams' lineups and you say there's not that many weak links in there. Um, and, and, you know, the, the big-name players on every team are being big-name players, you know? Like a Fraser, for example, he's, he's doing his job, he's getting assists, he's getting goals, um, he's impacting games. Um, and, you know, there's a player like that for every team. And, and I think that overall, just the quality of play has, has really increased from 2019 to 2021. So um, you said there there was some weak links. So who exactly were you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe like a Connor James or something. <laughs> so um, I, I really appreciate you doing this, man. And I don't want like, to keep you here all night, but I could probably talk to you all night. Um, one of the things we do on the show is uh, if you're going to play in a five-a-side tournament uh, with the players you've played with, uh, who makes your team? With the players I've played with. So if you want to, this is because I said like we don't always get we don't we haven't had an awful lot of goalkeepers on. So you can have a keeper. You can choose not to have a keeper. You can pick yourself if you want to, if you're that way yeah. inclined. So yeah, whatever you want to do. You know what I was thinking about doing? Maybe just uh, an all goalkeepers. Oh, <laughs> all goalkeepers. I love it. I love um, it. Okay, we're playing five aside. All right, I'm I'm gonna have to go with. Um, Okay, Marco, Marco Carducci's on there for sure. I'll go with all of my buddies here. Marco Carducci, Tyson Farrago, uh, Dylan Powley, and Nathan Ingham. So those will be my four. And then I'll go with Lars Hirschfeld as my fifth. <laughs> Mate, that's uh, I actually think that would have a good I think that'll have a good chance of uh maybe not scoring too many goals, but no. at least like uh a lot of clean sheets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what? It, a bunch of guys that'll be getting stuck in. I can tell you that. Sure. <laughs> five crazy bastards trying to play five side football. I love it. I love exactly. It. Right. So, so man, I really appreciate you doing this. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the season. Um, it's great to see Edmonton getting back there because I've always said since the league started that 
the league needs a strong Edmonton because it's one of the iconic clubs here in Canada and uh, we, we needed to have a, a strong team. And with Alan at the helm, it looks like he's going in the right direction. So thanks, man. Um, amazing people are born on the 17th of July. Never forget that. And- <laughs> Very true. Very true. <laughs> so take care, man. And-